Hello, and welcome to this episode of the AWS podcast series, Innovation Ambassadors. I'm Sarah Armstrong, your host and head of Innovation and Transformation Programs at AWS. Along with my co-hosts from around the world, we'll act as your ambassadors to some of the most interesting prototyping and innovation engagements with our AWS customers. We provide you with a roadmap to innovation and cloud technology solutions. We're so glad you joined us on this journey. On this episode of Innovation Ambassadors, we're showcasing the journey of the Genome Institute of Singapore, GIS, a national initiative with a global vision to use genomic sciences to achieve extraordinary improvements in human health and public prosperity. We'll delve into GIS's role as the trusted producer, custodian, and curator of Singapore's genomic data and explore their work with our prototyping team to provide seamless integration and access to massive amounts of genomic data in a secure and scalable framework. I'm excited to welcome from the Genome Institute of Singapore, Sichuan Shi, head of the Office of Research IT. Sichuan, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, thanks for having me. And joining us from AWS Prototyping, we have Callum Smits, Senior Software Development Engineer from our Envision Engineering team in Brisbane. Thanks for being here, Callum. Pleasure to be here. Sichuan, can you share a little bit with our listeners about what the mission of the Genome Institute of Singapore is? Sure. So the Genome Institute of Singapore is a research institute under the Agency for Science and Technology Research. And what we do is we read, review, and write DNA for the good of everyone. Fantastic. And who are the main consumers or users of the data that you write? Right. Um, so there will be um, scientists within the institute, obviously and as well as our collaborators, which includes those from pharmaceuticals or the, um, the hospital, the clinicians from hospitals. So these data sets, as I understand it, are very large, right? Hundreds of terabytes of data. Yes. Set the scene for us a little bit about some of the barriers that traditionally existed in scientists and clinicians accessing these data. Right. So, so as I said, um, the data sites are pretty sizable, and, and it is very common for a project to have hundreds of terabytes or sometimes even out of a petabyte. So just imagine that to work with this data, essentially what you need to do can be reduced to, well, first you have to make sure that you have the right compute environment to run analysis, right? So that to work with data of this size, it has to be sizable. So this can take you um, weeks or even months to ensure that you have access to the right platform. And once you have that or you have assurance of that, then you need to think about, okay, how are you going to get data onto that platform, right? So since your data is 100 terabytes, then that if your environment, computer environment, is a cluster that's installed several kilometers away, then that can be, get pretty challenging, right? So imagine you have, what well, it means you can move 100 terabytes, it means you have a petabyte across a wire. So it's actually really expensive to do. It sounds like in the traditional sense, if you had to do this alone and as a individual scientist or researcher, is that right? This can be a showstopper, yes, uh, if you do not have uh, access to, to adequate resources. It's really hard. Yeah, so talk to us about your vision for Raptor, the Research Assets Provisioning and Tracking Online Repository. That's a long name for a really cool concept, isn't it? But it's a good acronym. <laughs> Thank you. When we started out, I think the most primary motivation behind Raptor is to do exactly what we just described, right? To get data to those who need it. And how we get around that problem is, is that we want to have a platform that obviously can host the data that you need. And at the same time, we, uh, the platform will allow you to provision compute resources right next, to, okay, comes actually next to the, where the data is stored. So the idea being that anybody who has a good scientific question can start working on data immediately without having to go through the weeks or months of you know, uh, getting a, the necessary computer resources and all that. And so for Raptor, Raptor is really a, the primary world division. It's, it's just to ensure that scientists, once work on data, can do so immediately on demand. Wonderful. So how did you come to work with Callum and the team? I guess when we first moved to this idea in 2018, 2019, we were booking with Amazon for quite a few years now. So we are really keen to explore the possibility of building a, a, such a platform using cloud native services. But at that time, because um, we were not that familiar with native services. I mean, of course, we understand how to do this uh, using if we do a forklift, but we think we can get a better, better outcome by using native services. So we shout to our then account manager, Charissa, who then linked us to Caleb. 
and Kalem and you know, the first call Kalem to us, they in fact have been working on some a, a similar problem and and they are, they have a prototype that um, that we can just play with. I guess that's how we got started. Yeah. Callum, take us from there. How did we approach the prototype and determine what we would actually build? Yeah, so we started off with holding a working backwards workshop with the customer, um, in this case, Xixuan, and we understood what were the key challenges, uh, like what he was saying about being able to get access to the right people at the right time with the software they needed. And so from there, we started working on what would become the prototype. And I guess we approached it from the point of view of the scientists that would be using this. And most scientists are not experts at cloud or using the AWS console. So one key feature, which is easy to overlook, is that actually we just gave a simple web application that the end user, so the scientist, will log into. And so they log in to the web application and they can see list of projects in one tab. They're able to see the projects they have access to. There's some ability to discover things, create new data sets. They can select the things they want to work on today and just click next. And then they can select the type of compute that they want to use and click next and then essentially launch it. Right? And so what we mean by that is actually under the hood, we have serverless technologies and they click launch and then in five or 10 minutes, they are presented with the instructions to access it. So in essence, it was about giving a good user experience to remove all the barriers to people being able to do their research. Talk to us a little bit about the security that you were able to build in to ensure that the data that our scientists were accessing were secure and that they only had access to the data that they were meant to the scientists were able to choose the data that they wanted access to. What happened under the hood was we had this data in a S3 bucket, but we needed a way to limit access to just the data that researcher was supposed to have access to, what they had requested access to. And what we used was new technology at the time, was an S3 access point. And so this allowed us to create a new S3 access point with a policy that defined just what data that research environment needed access to. And then that was then what the user had access to from their end compute. Absolutely. So Tsushuan, that was really important to you in developing this framework, wasn't it? That safety was built right in from the very beginning. Yes, absolutely. So I think one of the um, changes that we are are seeing that started a couple of years ago is that I think increasing genomics data is is, is no longer needed as just scientific data, right? So that there are a lot more attention that's with respect to protecting the patients or the stuff such as privacy, for instance, right? So so there's a lot more uh, focus on data security. And so when we were designing this platform, the way we took was that we, we first started with the assurance that we want to provide to our collaborators, the clinicians for especially, right? So in, in particular, well, the framework that we adopted so many of ISAs where it, is we broke down the assur- with the assurances into safe purpose, safe people, safe setting, safe data, and safe output. So under each category, we look at what promise do we want to make. And once we identify the assurance we want to give, then we map it into the features that, that's available on Amazon. So in this case, um, the prototype that, that Kalem built. Right, and Kalem, in addition to that access security that you provided, There is also the auditability and traceability of what was actually being done with the data. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. One of the early requirements was to keep an audit trail of everything that happened in the system. And the way that we solved that was using Quantum Ledger Database, so QLDB, to keep track of every event that happens in the system and to let the administrators be able to see what went on. Sichuan, that's so important in the scientific community, isn't it? That traceability and provenance of the data sets. So the role of Raptor is, is to enable GIS to be a, um, the data custodian, right? And that means we need the data owners to trust us in the sense that we need to be able to show that owners will always know or they can always find out what has happened to that data. And it is therefore important for, to assure them that what the events that we record are, are not fungible, right? We cannot, even as administrators, go back and erase our mistakes, for instance. So I think that goes a long way to assuring um, our data, the data owners. 
all about experimentation, right? And we often talk in this podcast about the experimental nature of prototyping as well and how that's an iterative process. And and sometimes we have things that don't go exactly the way we thought they would. Callum, was there something here that was a particular challenge or an area that you had to overcome? I think the key one was actually what I talked about earlier is the end result that was in the prototype, the S3 access point. Early versions, we used a backup policy to manage access. And a key problem was that you have a limit there, which means you actually can't have many concurrent users. So by swapping to using an S3 access point, the default limit for an AWS account is 1,000. And that's a soft limit, so it's raisable. And that meant that straight away, we let GIS be able to run 1,000 concurrent studies on their data sets. Really scaling out the ability of your platform and framework. Shiswan, is that right? Yes, absolutely. So um, prior to the SGSS point, the way we go around this problem, this issue, you know, about they have problems, is, is always that we, we have a bucket for every use case, essentially, or like every project, right? And we were, we were very quickly run our buckets. Uh, so I remember there was a point that we were sending out, you know, requests just to create more buckets. So having the SS points really took that way. And I think what's important about the SS points is that it's actually make things more secure. Because there's so many buckets, right? Um, it's just tracking those buckets. That is, is a problem on, on, on its own, right? We need policies, we need applications, we need business logic just to make sure that we don't forget a particular bucket. And now that's reduced to just prefix, right? It's just one bucket. So it does wonders for consistency. It does wonders for, for observability and manageability. So in that sense, I, I think this all, these are all critical criteria that to a more secure application. Well, Callum and the team are only there for a short period of time. Tell us a little bit about the journey after they left. How have you built the system out to scale and accommodate the community? After we, t- we took over the prototype, I mean, that was a wonderful demo they did. Everyone got very excited. So we got some early users who came on board and worked with us. And then we start to extend the platform to what we call real life scenarios, right? It wasn't that easy. Not because of the lack of controls or the features of Amazon, but it was hard to find the right balance between security and performance and flexibility, right? So it actually took us a little bit longer to get to the point that we, we are happy with. We thought it was going to be just a few months and we ended up taking a one and a half years almost to get to the point that we, we think that, okay, this is, we like what we see now. But since then, it's of course life. And um, I'm pretty proud to say that as of now, we're hosting more than 100,000, uh, generally data from more than 100,000 individuals, uh, mostly local. And I think that what one of the nice things that what made me really be proud as the application owner is that we have witnessed um, scientists who start to do meta analysis using multiple large data sets. This alone, it doesn't sound that impressive, but prior to this platform, to do that kind of study, it means that the, the scientists will have to, well, you know, individual provision hundreds of terabytes from different project groups and find a way to put them into the same um, staging storage area and so on. This is a process that take, it, it can easily take months. And now it's near instantaneous. So the moment from the point that the, the, uh, the scientists had, had secured all the permissions, uh, authorizations, and everything just a few button clicks away. But that's, I think, where our platform has made the, the biggest impact. Nice. I, I really find it inspiring, this idea of making it easier to do scientific inquiry and reducing those barriers to the data. Chiswan and Colm, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your journey. And I'm wondering if that you had some insights that you would like to share, reflections from this engagement that you would share with our listeners. I'll start with you, Callum. Oh, look, it, it's so rewarding to have built this and see it being used and hosting so much data and really helping GIS push the boundaries of science. Sichuan, final words for you. The, the, the main takeaway take I have from this is that, um, first of all, it's, it's balancing security and, and, and you know, performance factor. It's, it's hard still. And I think it's really important that, uh, that we, we sort of approach this from, from backwards, right? We start with how, what the assurance that we want to provide in terms of security and once, you know, what promise to one provide us the scientists in where when it comes to um, flexibility of performance or resources. And then we, from there, we work backwards and then we try to discover the features that we need. And then from there, we map that to, to the, the services that's available on the platform, right? On Amazon in this case. So I, I think that's what worked for us, you know. 
Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the work you're doing to advance scientific research. Thank you. Sichuan, Colm, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our listeners for coming on today's journey with us. Look for future episodes of our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Share your ideas for future episodes or comments on this one via the email in the description. Thank you.